This is a talk on uh, basically going from JavaScript to Go. It's for people who might be writing JavaScript currently, who uh, may or may not have exposure to Go, who may or may not have touched Go before, um, who may or may not know that all of these nice projects are written in Go. Um, the audience for this is sort of like JavaScript is everywhere. It's on phones, it's on TVs, it's in browsers, it's on servers, it's literally everywhere you can imagine it. Um, and sometimes it would be nice to write servers in not JavaScript. Um, I am Chris Biscardi. Um, I currently work for Honeycomb IO, which is an observability product. Um, we all of our backend services are written in Go. Our front end is written in not Go. Um, I basically run on coffee, caffeine, like a bunch of other people. Um, and <laughs> Uh, my Twitter handle is at Chris Biscardi if you feel like hearing me rant about um, remote working and Go and JavaScript and a bunch of other things. So why should you listen to me? Um, I first was exposed to Go at Docker in 2014. Uh, I built the UI team there. Uh, we went from about 30 people to about 250 people. It was my first exposure to Go. I didn't write a ton at Docker. But I have written a bunch since then. Uh, in between sort of all of these things that I've done, I always go back to consulting. And when I go back to consulting, I use things that I've learned in my previous endeavors to get new projects. And Go has been one of them that's panned out really well. Uh, after Docker, I uh, started the design systems team at Dropbox. And currently, I am uh, on the product team at Honeycomb, where all of our services are written in Go. So for the JavaScript crowd, <laughs> new logo, everybody. <laughs> uh, so for the JavaScript crowd, this talk is sort of targeted at um, making them believe that they can and should learn how Go works, because it is not as complicated as JavaScript. And if you learn Go, it can be this awesome gateway into these projects that everybody is talking about all the time, like Docker, like Kubernetes, uh, things like Cilium. So that's a little small. But to talk a little bit about like what, is, what Golang is and where it sits in relation to everything else, uh, Brad Fitz had this really nice slide in 2014 uh, where Go is basically a general purpose programming language that sits somewhere above C, C++, and Java on the fun and easy for humans to use, but somewhere right of JavaScript and Ruby and Python on the ability to get actual performance out of your code. And this is interesting from a JavaScript perspective, because JavaScript engineers are not thinking about, uh, should I write this project in JavaScript, or should I you know, go right down to C? It's, <laughs> it's just not, it's not a trade-off that you make, right? But, you can make this trade-off with Go, right? People who write JavaScript can think of Go as sort of like a smaller, less featureful version of JavaScript, right? There, there's fewer keywords. Uh, I think the difference is 25 for Go and like 60 for JavaScript, depending on the environment that you're running in, because there's plenty of environments for JavaScript to run in. So if it's a faster JavaScript, with less keywords, what can we use it for? It's general purpose, so we can compile it into static binaries. This is really interesting for JavaScript engineers because we're used to having to ship around this giant swath of node modules all over the place. Right? So if I want to like deploy something to a server for node, I have to ship a lot of files. If I want to deploy something with Go, I can ship a single binary. And this talk is going to be more about backend services than it is about CLIs, but there, Go is useful for a bunch of different things. Um, and if you want to, say, use protocol buffers and some of the nice gRPC mechanisms on the backend to communicate between your services, Go is a great choice. It's obviously also good for talking to SQL databases like anything else. Uh, it has really good support for concurrency with Go routines. And another benefit that it has over JavaScript is it compiles straight to machine code. 
So instead of using V8 and running in VMs uh, like JavaScript would, it Go compiles right down to machine code and you get that extra performance boost without the additional layer of abstraction. So if we're gonna think about Go as sort of this less featureful uh, but faster and nice to use JavaScript, then we need to talk a little bit about what Go leaves out relative to JavaScript. And it leaves out sort of classes, inheritance, constructors, exceptions, things that JavaScript programmers are pretty used to using. So if you look at the syntax that's come out in the JavaScript community over the last couple of years, you'll see things like this where you have this ES6 class, you have static or not static class properties, you have functions with shortened function notation, but Go doesn't have classes, so that goes out the window. And since Go doesn't have classes, it also doesn't have inheritance, um, and that means you're not doing anything like this anymore. But it does have interfaces. And interfaces get you a really long way without classes and without inheritance. In this case, for anybody who hasn't seen sort of Go interfaces before, we have an animal interface. And an the animal interface basically just says that you have to implement this function to be considered part of this interface. So dog struct uh, implements the name interface, or the animal interface, sorry. It implements the name function. And it also implements some other functions, like bark. But it doesn't matter. Another thing that Go does not have that JavaScript people use fairly frequently, um, whether explicitly or through a comp compilation process, are constructors. Uh, JavaScript programmers knew things around all the time, whether they know it or not. But since Go doesn't have them, it turns out that Go doesn't actually need them. Go doesn't need them because it's trivial to construct a factory that returns you the thing that you want. Go does also not have exceptions. And that means we don't have try catch, we don't have finally. We don't have to worry about something that is a normal error being thrown and causing the entire program to crash. Which brings us to an interesting uh, relationship with the Node ecosystem in that Node for a very long time was based on callbacks before we had promises, before we had async await. And the callback world of Node.js has these things that we sort of termed error backs or callbacks with a very specific signature about whether you got an error and a value. And a lot of Go code looks very, very, very similar, where you have multiple return values from this function os.open. So we're opening a file. We may or may not have an error. We have to check the error, and then we can continue. So it's surprising how similar some of the actual mechanisms in Go are to the way we use JavaScript. And of course, Go is pretty small. If we're going to consider it JavaScript with less language features, uh, we need to talk about how many it has. We need to talk about what they are. Most of these, or at least half of these, uh, are familiar to JavaScript programmers already. It's only about 25 keywords. You know, you've got break, case. You know, Chan will probably be new, but do you really need it when you're first starting out? And JavaScript has about 60 reserved words between now and future reserved words, and depending on the environment that you're running in, whether it's strict or not. So you, a JavaScript engineer, are sitting down to write your first Go application. What does that look like? First, you have to get the language, right? First, you have to have it installed locally. And you can either do this through, say, like Homebrew if you're on OS X or another package manager, or uh, both Go and Node offer package downloads from websites, so you just grab it. The really nice thing about Go's package downloads is that you just get this set of binaries that do an amazing amount of things for you. Right? You get Go, you get GoDoc, you get GoFormat. And GoFormat is sort of like prettier for Go. It was around before prettier, but. And another amazing thing about the Go ecosystem and these binaries that you get is that it sort of forces you to write documentation. And not only does it force you to write documentation, but it means that uh, sites like godoc.org can go and reach out to GitHub whenever you want to go look up a package. 
and compile that documentation for you and just host it. Like, there, there's nothing like this in the Node ecosystem. There's no NPM package that will go and fetch documentation and show it to you all on the same site. Um, if a Go package references another Go package, you can see that documentation all on godoc.org, right? If an MBM package depends on another MBM package, you probably won't know until you install it. So if we talk a little bit about how you initialize a new project, um, in JavaScript, it takes a lot of work um, to set up a raw project. You have to make your directory, obviously, and CD into it. Uh, usually use yarn or npm to initialize a package.json file. It's usually the same thing every time, minus like the name. Uh, so it gets a little annoying after a while. Uh, you create your first script file, whatever that is, and then you install uh, the rest of npm. You have to get a test runner. And in addition to a test runner, you have to get uh, an assertion library, things like that. Anything that you want to do for like table-based tests or anything like that all have libraries that you need to install. If you want to use syntax or you want to use syntax that isn't available in an environment that you want to target, for example, if I'm writing on, say, node 10 and I want to target node 6, I have to do something to compile that down to node 6, right? And if it's running in a browser, it gets even worse. And then you need a bunch of packaging libraries. You need Rollup or Webpack or uh, any of the other sort of like, this is how I get my code together and ship it so other people can use it. And the other way that you sort of start a, a node project is you can install a project-specific package or <laughs> project-specific sort of project generator, right? Express is a common one. You install the Express generator, and then you have this Express command globally available, and you can start a new project. This is similar to the way that uh, Create React App or Yeoman would do it. Project initialization for Go is super simple. You make a directory in your Go path at the sort of remote network address, which is, in this case, uh, my GitHub name is Christopher Biscardi. I'm naming my project my project because uh, I'm super original, and I'm um, hosting it on GitHub because uh, why would I use a distributed uh, version control system? Uh, and then you just touch main.go. You run go build because you already have the tools. You can run go test because you already have the tools. You can run go vet because you already have the tools, and format because you already have the tools. You don't need to install anything else. If you go get this, you just get the binary for, say, Cobra who definitely nobody in this room has ever worked on. And you can just initialize a new Cobra project and build it. So what do you actually get when I'm talking about this Go tool, right? There are a whole host of commands that you can use when trying to build or test or vet a project. The ones that you really care about are format, because you basically have to run that to be compatible with everybody else in the ecosystem, and it's built in. Uh, you want to know about things like vet, but are they super important? Not when you're starting out. You want to know build, and you want to know run, right? Because if you have code, you want to be able to build it. You want to be able to run it. Everything else you can basically just wait on, and when you need to hit it, run go test and figure out what it does. So that brings us to dependency management, which is... I don't want to say a solved problem in the Node ecosystem, because uh, there are plenty of edge cases and plenty of corners to get yourself stuck in. But it's almost significantly less solved in the Go ecosystem. And there are a lot of projects coming out that either uh, maybe you used Glide a long time ago, maybe you're using um, any number of other things. Maybe you're just like committing code in your vendor repo. And for Node people, uh, the tool that's closest to what they already know is Depth. So you get DEP just like you get any of the other packages, uh, like Go or Node. You can DEP init a new project, just like you can yarn or npm init a new project. It gets you the equivalent of a package.json and a yarn.lock file. And you're off to the races. You, you can just start importing libraries. And because, because Go references packages based on their remote network URL, DEP can just pull them down for you. And if you want them and you're not going to import them yet, 
you can use a, an add command with that. And in the future, maybe you want to go and look at Vigo or something like that. But So if we're going to build a new project, we're going to build a new API. We're probably going to use Express for Node. Express is based on middleware, app.use. This is a lot of code to get basically nothing done. For Go, we can use the standard library, which is great because in JavaScript, there, you're not going to use the standard library to do this stuff. You can do it, but nobody really does it. The Go standard library is really strong. And there's very few uh, edge cases here that are kind of, eh, do I really want to be doing that? Like the uh, request.url.path is a little bit hacky because we're sort of like slicing this thing off and like, meh. Nah. But we can get over that. We can use a third party package. And third party packages let you name them and pull in URL parameters. That's great. It's more familiar to Express users. It's more familiar to Node users. And then when we want to actually configure this, like say we're going to talk to a database or something, we need the database URL. We need the authentication credentials. Uh, in Node, you are checking process.env.whatever your environment variable is all over the place. Uh, there's other solutions like Cosmic Config and things like that, but they're really for like CLI tools more than they are for actual services. And Viper is sort of um, head and shoulders above anything in the Node ecosystem. It supports a wide variety of file formats. It supports watching and rereading. And this is sort of where you start to realize uh, Go's sort of system origins. Like JavaScript, people were never too concerned with parsing all of the different configuration file formats and getting all of that data in, and then watching and like communicating with etcd or console, and then like making sure that the process didn't have to like die and then come back up to get that environment variable back in. But the Go people already already thought about that. It's super easy, right? You just bind the NVAR, and then you read it. And if you want to do something more complex, there's documentation on it, right? If you want to continuously watch something like etcd for changes, and then access the environment variable in the same way that you saw in the last slide, it's not that much code, right? Like, you, you just use a Go routine and continuously watch and then set a delay, and then watch again. And since Go routines are so cheap, it doesn't really matter. So to talk to some databases, uh, JavaScript people usually use something like Connex. They usually use uh, some kind of query builder. It's nice. It's, it's not bad. Um, but we can do better. Uh, and Connex isn't standard library, which means that you have to go import a package to go use it. And you have to know that the package is there in the first place. Go has database slash SQL, right? And yeah, OK, maybe it's not a query builder. Maybe you have to write out SQL by hand and then make sure that you're using question marks or whatever you want to use for the replacement. But we can fix that too, right? If we're going to use a third party package, we can use a third party package. And then we actually get types around all of our SQL calls, right? And if I want to use an ORM, which personally I don't particularly like ORMs, but a lot of people do, uh, this is an ORM that people usually use in JavaScript called Bookshelf. And the alternative in Go is GoRM. And GoRM, you can just imagine this is your sort of main .go file. Uh, this is a main package. You import a couple of things. Maybe you use dep to get them, dep and sure. Uh, this little underscore means that it's only being imported for side effects, so we're not actually going to use anything from that package directly. We have a product type where we embed the interface for the GORM model, which is part of the reason we don't really need inheritance. Then we just open it. We check the error, see if it's null. Panic if it's not. Another new syntax thing here is uh, db.close with defer. And defer basically means that uh, clean this up after I'm done, after the function exits. Auto migrations creates everything you would expect from an ORM with an easy to use interface. So now we've got an API that talks to a database. How do we get it into the real world? If we're going to get it into the real world, 
uh, something that's really nice about Go is static, static builds. If you statically build something, you can also cross compile it to a different platform. And a really simple way to ship it if you're not statically building it is to containerize it. This is a very simple Docker file. Um, unfortunately, it comes out to about 700 megabytes because it just, like, all of the build tools are in it. But if we build statically, we don't need that, and we can go from scratch and statically compile libc and everything else into our Go binary and end up with, like, a six megabyte Docker container. So coming to the end of my talk here, and I want to sort of talk a little bit about where Go gets us in terms of exploration. Because it opens up a whole new world of possibilities in terms of systems and orchestration and what do I do now that I'm running 50 different things in production? And this is a photo or an image of Cilium's architecture. And it really doesn't really doesn't matter if you understand this or not, right? It's, it's got network cards, it's got containers, it's got BPF, it's got something called bytecode injection, which, I don't know, sounds interesting. And Go basically gives you the keys to understand the Cilium code, right? So we've got BPF, we've got XDF, and you know maybe I have no idea what those mean. But I can pick an arbitrary Cilium file because a lot of it's written in Go. I can see that they're using some other packages. I can see that you're using Cobra. I know Cobra. I just talked about it. I can see that they're declaring a couple of variables. I can see that we need to make our map types. Maybe I didn't realize that before. Maybe I have to look up what make does. That's fine. Start a new Cobra command. This is our first function in the file. Set up KV store. Seems self-explanatory. It sets up a key value store. Second function in the file is sort of this init function. We can go into that and say, OK, it's doing a little bit of a mechanical kind of stuff, right? Maybe, maybe I don't know what persist flags is. Maybe I need to look that up in the uh, Gober documentation. But the, the Go language is simple enough and concise enough that if I'm coming from JavaScript, it's really easy to dive into any arbitrary piece of code, and it gives you this gateway into Kubernetes and containers and network plugins and CNI and all of this other cool stuff. 